empty the chamber on them. And how do you do that? Four, six seconds, point eight, point B, everything you got. Everything you got. Turn that shit up. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome to the Scoop World Order Day of Mourning edition. Uh, we suffered a terrible defeat to the Michigan Wolverines for seven, 20 years in the horseshoe. Uh, just a, an awful day, uh, a poor effort by the Buckeyes um, to get blown out in your home stadium. Uh, there's no other way around it. We were out toughed. We were out coached. We were outplayed. Uh, the Michigan Wolverines beat us, and it's something that needs to stop. Uh, it looked really easy for about 20 years with Jim Trussell and Urban Meyer. Now it's time to get back to being the tougher team and find out if Ryan Day's up to it. That being said, as always, we appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this content. Even on a day like this, we're going to give you our breakdown of a key sequence of plays, uh, give our thoughts on the game, uh, the whole nine yards. We appreciate you guys. As always, if you enjoy this content, leave us a like. Comment down below what needs to change at Ohio State. Two straight blowouts to the Michigan Wolverines, something we're not accustomed to. This isn't the 90s anymore. We had an amazing streak going under Jim Trussell and Urban Meyer, under Ryan Day, not so much. Uh, a lot of streaks are dying under Ryan Day, and uh, the playoffs look like they're out of it. Heisman's dead. A lot of things changed in 24 hours. So with that being said, bring in my good friend Nevada Buck. Nevada, how are you? Uh, man, you know, first of all, I want to say to everybody out there, I was so wrong on the game. I, I you know, I had, I really thought, the first half of the game went pretty much the way that I thought it was going to. I thought we would take away the run. I think we had forced, you know, JJ to pass. Uh, he hit a couple of big plays, but you know, that, that was all we, we covered the first half line. The first, I, I had bet heavily on the first half line minus two and a half. We covered the first half line. I thought, I thought the game could have been 28 to three at a halftime. So Ryan day had him ready to play. He had him ready to play. I thought the game plan was good. Um, and that went off the rails. What, what else, what else can you say? Just, we had it completely wrong. I never, ever, ever dreamed that a, a this Ohio state team would fold that badly in the second half. Um, you give up 10 yards rushing in the first half to give up 224 in the second half. I just, th these numbers are just kind of mind boggling. Um, I got to give Harbaugh credit. Harbaugh coached a heck of a game. I'm not a huge Harbaugh fan, but, you know, there's a reason why he coached the team to a Super Bowl in the NFL and, and won some big games at, uh, at Stanford. You know, he knows how to coach. And he certainly has learned. And he was coaching to win, man. He was coaching to win that game yesterday. And the bottom line was Ryan was coaching not to lose. And there's a big difference, you know, when uh, when Harbaugh ran that play with the uh, running back and the jump pass. and I mean, you could just tell he was going for it. And Day was punting on their side of the field and, and just his play calling was just disjointed. He abandoned the runway too early. And it was just, we got out coached, you know, plain and simple. Harbaugh came in and beat us with an inferior team, with an inferior quarterback on the road. And I just give them all the credit in the world because I just never dreamed they'd be able to do that. And they did it. And you just tip your hat. It wasn't the refs. It wasn't bad luck. It wasn't anything. It was just, they, they, they performed better and Harbaugh coached better. And, uh, that's 100% on Ryan Day, 100%. You know, Ryan Day has been able to bully the, you know, the uh, inferior teams. Yeah, he doesn't lose to Purdue and he doesn't lose to Iowa. And some people think that's that's great. That's, you know, that's the mark. That's why, you know, he's such a terrific coach. But boy, two weeks, or excuse me, two years in a row, getting just manhandled the second half by Michigan is unacceptable. And, and that is on him. I have talked to people that are on the headset when they, so they listen to when Ryan calls the plays. And I've heard that Ryan starts to panic in these big games when things start to when things start to go wrong. He'll start to panic. And I've never believed it. I've always thought that was just kind of chatter. I've never really bought into that. But it's palpable. You can feel the team tightening up. And when Michigan makes comments like, we knew that we'd keep the pressure on them. We knew that the, the pipe would burst. We knew that it would burst. They weren't talking about the Ohio State team. They were talking about Ryan Day. They were talking about if we keep the pressure on Ryan Day, he'll burst. He'll tighten up. And when he tightens up at halftime in a game that you're leading by three and you should be up by four touchdowns, that's what happens. So that, you know, Ryan Day has paid mil you know, tens of millions of dollars a year to be the head coach at Ohio State. And he has taken the car, driven it off the road, and set the car on fire right now. And that's just facts. That's, that's where we're at as a program right now. And that's on Ryan Day. And Ryan Day, unfortunately, 
I think we're, you know, we, we, you know, we have to fix Ryan Day. Ryan Day has got to do, do some soul searching and realize you can't just keep firing 40% of the coaching staff every year because you're going to run out of guys to fire. You're running out of fingers to point and blame other people. It's you, Ryan. You're the problem. Your culture is the problem. Your tendencies are the problem. Your, your aversion to the running game is the problem. We have become a Big 12 team. Whether we like it or not, that's, that's who we are right now. We used to laugh at those teams. But that's who we are. When when you practice exclusively against the pass and you don't practice the interior run and you don't you don't really commit to the interior run, I knew that the, the the first possession of the second half when we ran three times and got stopped, I knew that we wouldn't see it again. I think we ran three times after that. We ran for 134 yards halfway through the second quarter and ran for 20 more yards the rest of the game. I mean, he, Ryan Day abandons the run faster than anybody I've ever seen. It, it is part of his DNA. It's he, he does not like the running game. It's a necessary evil to him. Does not like the running game. He encourages his quarterbacks not to run. That's why CJ doesn't run. CJ was told when he was recruiting, oh, we'll, we'll make you a pocket passer. We're not going to ask you to run. And that appeals to a certain type of guy. That's not what you need to do to win in college football. In college football, you need to have a credible running threat. JJ McCarthy, who is not one-tenth of the pure passer that, that CJ Stroud is, just was way better than CJ Stroud yesterday. And as, and as a college quarterback, I'll take a kid like JJ McCarthy. I'll take Trace McSorley. I'll take JT Barrett. You can have all these beautiful passers. I'll take the guys that can, you know, you can't equate numbers around the goal line in the red zone. What do they need? When they need the biggest play of the game around the goal line, what do they do? They ran JJ McCarthy and he got in the end zone. And that's my feeling. So I give Michigan all the credit in the world. I did not believe, I thought they were a paper tiger. I did not believe that they could do it. They did it. It wasn't a fluke. They did it and they won and I tip my hat and that's, that's all I can say. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting now because we're not, we're not the tougher program anymore. And for 20 years, that's something that we hung our hat on our hard hat or work boots or Timberlands with steel toes in them. And we're not that anymore. You know, we, Michigan was always the wine and cheese crowd. We were the the tough guys, you know, the, the AJ Hawks, the Troy Smiths, the dogs, a little rough around the edges. You know, we had trust, we had urban, uh, and we aren't that, I mean, again, you know, I, I don't think you were that off on the game because at halftime, if, if I would have told you Michigan had 10 yards rushing at halftime, you'd be like, Holy smokes, we're up 35 to three and life is back to being good again. But you know, we kept it tight. And then in the second half, I mean, Michigan just came out and kicked our ass all over the field, couldn't make plays. And again, it's not just, you know, run blocking versus uh, shedding, you know, uh, shedding blocks. It's, you know, it, it's it's not making the plays when you need to. And, and frankly, you know, if I knew that I had to play with Enoch and Josh Wright guard, I would want to run more just to get them more comfortable. I mean, they're playing against Michigan. They're playing against Mozzie Smith, the best player, you know, on their team potentially. And, you know, he made, he made, uh, Enoch looked terrible on, on a pass protection. And, you know, you're putting these guys in some rough situations. I thought our tackles played decently well. Paris gave up a sack late. Um, you know, but I thought the O-line played better. But I think a lot of that's because they didn't have Aiden Hutchinson. And they didn't have uh, Ojo Ojobi or Ojobo or whatever his name was, the kid that went to the Ravens. So, I I don't know. It's, it's an interesting – you know, the program's at an interesting crossroads right now because there's a lot of people ready to jump off the ledge. Uh, the Larry Coker comparisons are coming out. Mark Richt. Uh, you know, is that what Ryan Day is? I don't know. Um, but holy shit, you had a home game. You had the Heisman favorite at quarterback. You have, you know, one of the most talented offensive lines in the country. You know, you're beat to shit at running back, but so were they. They lost. I mean, their running back's a Heisman finalist, and he played two plays. So that that's all square. You have the best, probably the best two receivers in the entire country. Marvin's number one. I can't imagine there's more than four or five guys better than Emeka. Emeka was on fire. Um, you know, your defense was playing well. You've got all this inertia. And then you have all the motivation for last year. Like Jim Harbaugh talked shit, said you were born on third base and didn't hit the, or you're, you're on third base, didn't hit the triple. Like basically called you out. You know, they said basically how soft the program was. So that, you know, we didn't have the flu this year. We didn't have all those other bullshit excuses. It wasn't loud. It wasn't Michigan stadium and it was snowy and cold. We just got our asses kicked. 50, 50 degree day, clear, perfect weather settings, like you're playing Madden. And, you know, and it's it's disheartening because there's guys on that team 
that really sold out. There's guys like Tommy Eichenberg who sold out. I mean, Tommy Eichenberg deserves better than some of the shit that some of his teammates did. Some of these guys taking personal fouls, those guys will never have to play for Ohio State again because, frankly, that was one of the turning points in the game. Like, I'm like, I, I, how big of a clown are you? You're going to do that. How selfish are you? Like, don't put them on the field ever again. You know, some of these guys need to hit the portal, do some soul searching, get back to being tough. Because, again, when I hear that, you know, Ryan Day tells Mickey Murati to back off on workouts two years ago. I heard that from a great source. Mickey was pissed. That's not good. When I hear how easy it is to work in the Woody Hayes now compared to what it used to be under Urban, that's not good. It'd be one thing if we were still steamrolling and buzzsawing schools, but we're not. So now that we're back to this point where we're 0-2 in the rivalry, we have to go to Ann Arbor next year. They got McCarthy back. We're going to have one of our new quarterbacks in there. Whole new O-line because we're likely to lose both tackles and Luke Whipler to the draft. It's going to be tough, you know, and, and these guys got to do some soul search. These guys got to go hit the portal. They got to go, you know, we're going to recruit well, like always. But like, you know, when you've got the Heisman favorite at quarterback at home coming off a loss, all of every possible ounce of motivation you could have and you lay an egg like that if, with everything on the line to win the big to, to go to the Big Ten championship, potentially go to the playoffs to win the Heisman trophy. And that's what you put on the field. Holy shit. What are we talking about? Um. I don't want to get too hot in about it. You got anything else to add before we go to this film room? No, I just, you know, it was, it was just such a weird, you know, you know, if we had just come out and laid the egg from the beginning, I'd be like, wow, man, I just had no clue on the game. I had no clue on the game. Like, like my read on the game coming up to it was the information I had was corn was really limited and was not going to be able to participate and not be a factor in the game. We would try to take away the run that we'd force McCarthy to pass and that we'd run that would, and that we'd play fast go with tempo and, and do our thing. And the, for the first half, we, we did that for the most part. And then, then they started going away from the tempo. Then, you know, McCarthy hit those couple of big plays, but you know, that happens sometimes in football. I, you know, I, I'm not as upset about the big plays. We knew that when Knowles came in, if you play cover zero, if you, if you, if you blitz, if you play, you know, look, that stuff's going to happen. But we got the shootout. We got the track meet that we wanted to, and then we couldn't respond. That's what I don't understand. If we had just come out and just Michigan was better and they just beat us, it's like Nevada. You don't know what you're talking about. And Michigan was just way better. You're you're a clown. You don't got. We we just we we just completely dominated those guys the first half. They could do nothing, and then in the second half, we can do nothing. And I, like I said, after seeing that two years in a row, after last year's nine and a half yards of carry in the second half, and you and I are sitting thinking that could never happen again. That 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 was the worst thing that we've ever seen. We'll never see that again, ever. And it happens the next year. So, um, I don't know. Let's, let's go to the film room to a, a, a sequence that I that I thought was really, you know, the game was 10-3. to 3. We're dominating the game. We had multiple possessions. And I feel like we're on the verge of kind of taking Michigan out of the game. This this three-play sequence happened and um, was, was really costly. Yeah, so we're going to just run this real quick. Um and this was a play you called from the from the jump. So this is just a, a basic a pistol run. Mine Williams. I mean, you couldn't have a better look. Like at this point, you're like, holy, this is gonna go for 50 yards. I mean, the blocking Paris is putting his guy in the ground. You know, Donnie's got this guy hooked. Cade's releasing out for the nickel. You know, you got your receivers. You know, I mean, it's everyone's accounted for. This is just a big mash. And you just got green space and mine, we're gonna let it run. Like right here. Like Paris is literally throwing his guy on the ground. These guys, everyone inside's taken care of. Cade's got to get this block. Now, Cade misses this block, and I love Cade over to death. But just to be fair, this is a very tough call when you're blocking this guy because you know, as he's seeing all this shape up, you see Marvin has his guy hooked, and Cade is coming out here trying to get leverage to hook his guy. So you run it all the way through, and and again. Part of it is, you know, mine's out there 50%. Like, mine is mine is trying to gut it out. But, I mean, he he just has no burst. He's in second gear. He can't get to that fifth or sixth gear. Um, but, like, you look at this edge, and it's like, you know, Marvin's got his guy sealed. He's going to crack the safety. And then you have Cade out here for this nickel. And you're like, this, this is going to go for 70 yards. You know? Like, like literally. I mean, the guy that, the guy that, the next guy in the frame, this guy, 26, is a defensive tackle. Literally, he's right here. This is the guy that's in the frame. And if mine is in fifth gear, they're not catching him here. 
I mean, correct, Nevada? Yeah, I, I thought that that play, you know, it's funny when the play happened, you know, I thought to myself, oh, man, you know, this place, go, this, you know, first of all, I couldn't understand what Mayan was doing in there in that situation because, you know, people were getting on Trey Henderson about not playing, but I'm like, you know, if you can't go, then don't go. I'm okay with that. Mayan playing at 50% wasn't helping us out there. I thought Chip, they had no answer for Chip. They had no answer for Chip. I would have loved to see Dallin. Dallin, I, I would love to see Xavier take that. The one time Xavier touched the ball, would he go for 18 yards? Like, yeah. that that play was blocked up so well, and it set up a third and five, and, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I hope this doesn't come back to haunt us because that play was blocked up so well, we should at least be in field goal range right now, or maybe you, you take that thing all the way all the way to the house and, and thought that was a big play. Then we follow it up on, on the next play, so we come back. Now it's third and five. We've got Mayan out there who's clearly hobbling. Why Alford's running him out there, I have no idea. But we run another play, and this one's blocked up really well. So this one, you slow it down. and it, it, Look at this. He gets into the hole, and he's got one guy there to beat. One guy. And he just kind of. Yeah, I mean, he's, he, he's, he's, he's gearing down. Like, he doesn't, doesn't have the burst. He can't put his shoulder down. I think Michigan does an excellent job schematically. What they do is they have this, they have the nose guard. This is, so this is bare defense. This is what Virginia Tech ran against us. The nose actually folds over. He follows the puller. They run a double pull counter here and he folds over and follows, he follows the guard right into the hole, which this is, this is great scheme by, by Michigan's defense. And it's also because they've scouted us up. Now, if this was Urban Meyer or if this was a team, you know, that, that was actually, you know, smart enough to run the quarterback. If you wanted to just destroy this instantly, you could just run speed option. You have, you know, you call it zero, like we just call it zero with Urban. You have him jump over here, and then all of a sudden you you seal here, seal here, seal here. I mean, th this thing would be fucking out the gate. Holy shit. Like, if you couldn't run this against Urban, you know, with, with this look with these receivers, you go to speed option here, and you pitch off this guy, and you tell these guys to block, and there's just nobody home. Like this is the greatest speed option look of all time, honestly. But we don't we don't do that, and they know that, and they use that against us because we'll never check to that, you know. So, and these guys aren't checking out anything. But yeah, you know, we run our double pull counter, which is fine. Um, you know, Luke gives up a lot of penetration. He has a really tough block here. Um, and but but again, like you know, we we get it blocked up, but you know, we have the we have the free guy in the hole because the the nose folds over with the puller, which again. I don't know how much Michigan's done that. Hopefully we scouted that because, again, I don't watch Michigan's defensive film other than the Ohio State game. But, you know, if this is something that, that we knew they were going to do, you know, because because basically what happens is, you know, our, our kick guy is Donnie. He's kicking the end here in this bear luck. And then PJ is, is, is pulling for this linebacker. Now, when they do this fold over with the nose, that the linebacker is going to be free sitting here because he eats up PJ. There's PJ right there. So, again, this is... This is tough because all of a sudden you've got, you know, you've got Josh Fryer. You know, Josh Fryer has an impossible luck. You got Dewan coming down here. Again, if it's third and five, we're running it. I mean, like Dewan, Dewan gets enough here, but Dewan should be able to kill this guy and push him across. You know, the only way you can really defend this, if you want to be like, if you want to be great, which again, this is hard at the moment, is you got to get, you got to get these guys to recognize if this guy's going to fold over and have Dewan do a more vertical double team. And have him push him over. But again, you know, Josh Fryer is flying down for this nose. But, you know, it just depends on how much they did this. Because this is a great scheme by Michigan. So they've got a guy right in the hole. I don't love the call by our, by our guys. You know, it looks great at the initial. But as soon as they fold over, we're screwed. Because, you know, these two, you know, this is a down block, a down block, back block, fold block. And then you got a guy for here, the guy for here. But the problem is, is that. Paris and Josh Fryer have to basically switch on the, or excuse me, yeah, Paris and Josh Fryer have to switch on the fly. So Josh is supposed to have the nose. Paris is supposed to have him. But when this guy folds over the way he does, which again, this is a great scheme. Michigan State used to do this all the time in the trussle days of D'Antonio because we ran power so much. So they would literally tell the, the defensive tackle, just follow the guard. If the guard pulled, just go with him into the hole because that, that kind of, that's a good way to disrupt the power game, which is, that's kind of what counter is. Um, but yeah, you know, again, like if if I feel like if 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 he's healthy, he at least can put his foot in the ground and get vertical. 
But again, this is you know, this is just their defense out scheming our offense. And again, this is after a look back. Like we did a look back here to get into this play. And again, I don't know if they if they anticipated this, but if they did, we just didn't execute it. We did a poor job of executing it, and that's on us. Like this is a play where if we knew that that nose and the bear defense was gonna um was gonna follow the guard into the hole, which he does. I mean, it basically it makes the play this is when you call I think a loser play, this is a loser play. If you know that they're going to do this with their nose guard against a pulling guard, it's a loser play. You're going to, you're, you have to get out of it because you're outnumbered, you know, unless, unless Josh Fryer can do the most Herculean task ever of somehow, you know, he's coming off on this nose guard. He's a fantastic player. And then you know, he's got to stop and then, and then veer back to this linebacker. It's just, you know, like, like the best guard in the history of football can do that. So again, that's a loser play. We checked into it because we did our look back thing. So um, yeah, I don't know. Not, not a great, not a great deal there. When, especially when we're, yeah, we're, we did the look back where we're, we're in a play and then we check out of the play. Um, and I'm just fast forwarding to the next play. What are your thoughts on that Nevada? Cause I just gave a diatribe well, for about five minutes. It, yeah, no, I know. And, and also my head hurts from the running backwards and forwards. So I apologize to anybody out there in YouTube land who's expressing, uh, nausea or anything from all the times we ran back and forth on that. But no, my end. I mean, to me, that's a play where if, you know, if mine Williams is at 100%, mine Williams beats that guy in the hole with some speed, you know, gets through the tackle, at least gets to the first down marker. Um, but mine at 50% or 60% or or whatever they were running him out there at doesn't get it. So I don't know why he was out there in that situation. That, that whole sequence to me was a, a wasted sequence at a huge point in the game where, you know, how does Chip do if you run that play? Does Chip run through that guy? Does Chip at least get to the first down marker? I think he might. There was a there was a lane right there. I know there was a guy right there, but I mean, you 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 hit that guy with the last. You could tell mine was gearing down, and mine was gearing down at that spot. So now now it sets up fourth and two. After we've kind of missed that opportunity on that second and thirteen, we've kind of whiffed on that thing on that third and five. Now we've got a fourth and two, and here we go. And, and I. I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna run the play all the way through. We do the hide play where Cade fake blocks and then he releases. We've done that a thousand times this year. So eventually, teams figure out, hey, they like to run this fake block hide play. Different variations of it to Cade. Um, doesn't get off the block here. Uh, you know, guy sticks to him, runs with him. I think CJ throws a a, a poor ball here. Um, yeah, he's got a ton of green grass here you know, here, like, I mean, you got all this space and you try to throw it, like drop it in over his shoulder when this guy's draped on him. You know, I think if you wake and there's, and there's almost no pressure on him. Like, I mean, again, Josh Fryer loses late here. Um, you know, they're trying to sell the run fake hard to get the safety to bite in, but you know, 22, he bites, but you know, CJ could have, you know, he got to throw a better ball here. Like if you have Cade Silver with his arm brace reaching one handed to make the play, it's probably not the ideal situation. I, I hate, this personnel group. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stop. Let's stop that and run that back. Just, just, just show to. I just want to stop it at the point where the ball comes to him. Because one, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to run afoul of copyright. Secondly, I just want to show how much movement there is on the inside. I mean, there is nobody on the inside on this play. There's no yeah. one. Yeah. No, it's. it's and now it's, again, it's, I, 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 now, now is Cade. You know, you would know more than that. Is, is Cade just taught just to, to go right down the field on that or? Can he break that? I mean, are, are you supposed to take that route to the inside? Well, or here, here's, he just supposed to... here's the thing. I, I would imagine he's supposed to just run like a, like a, a just like a, a skinny nine route, you know, because the ball is going to be coming in like a millisecond because it's a pot. It's, it's basically a pop pass. So it's like, but, you know, I would, I would allow him to like bend it a little bit if there's nobody there. I mean, just run to the green grass. Like, I mean, because if he just, if he just bends this in, how the hell, he's not going to be covered. You know, so you can have a nice, easy throw instead of having, a guy draped on him because again, you know, they, they were, they were banking on this guy staying in dust, but again, Michigan, their defense is well coached. Like they they were banking on, on Cade throwing this guy to the ground, shucking him and then going, but like, you know, Cade doesn't get a good shuck here and the kids six to him. And, and again, these guys are well coached. These guys, they, we've run this play before. Um, we've shown these looks, you know, we're running three tight ends here, which again, I hate when it's, it's not cutting time. It's fourth and two. And you have a Mecca Buka, who's one of our, two best players on offense with Marvin Harrison Jr. on the sideline watching, and you have G Scott and Mitch Russell, you know, it, it, it just, it makes no sense to me. I'd rather run a jet sweep or something with, with a Mecca, um, but you can't not have him in the game, but you know, we get, we get good action, but you know, it's a, it's a bad throw misses him. 
And, and again, like if it's fourth and two, I'm throwing it to Marvin. Like, I'm sorry, I'm throwing it to the best receiver in the country or I'm, I'm doing something with a Mecca to get him in space. Hell, I might even hand it off to Mecca and just run a jet. Cause you know, again, like he's, he's that good with the ball. He's that talented with the ball in his hands. And instead we, you know, we, we dialed up Cade twice and I love Cade so over to death, but like, even he's probably like, why the hell are they throwing it to me on fourth and two and fourth down in the end zone when it's, when, you know, we're, we, we, we have the two best receivers in the country, potentially. It's like, I don't know. It was a mind numbing effort. Um, that could have been a, a you know, a 17, three right there. You know, if we, if we get down and score at, at a minimum, it's 13 to three. And uh, again, I think there were all these little turning points, all these little, all these little yards left on the field, all these little plays that, you know, we just didn't, they didn't work or didn't execute him correctly. I, I just, I don't know why you don't feature Marvin in that situation just because he's, he is Marvin Harrison jr. And he is the best receiver in the country. And if there's a guy that I'm going to throw it to on fourth down and I've got that guy, he's who's getting the ball. But again, it's easy to sit, up, sit back on Sunday and do that. But it's just my opinion. Uh, Nevada, any closing thoughts on this? Uh, I'm going to wrap this one. Uh, I'm sure we'll be breaking down this game for a long time because we don't have a big 10 championship to worry about and we don't have the playoffs to worry about. So, we're going to break this down for probably the next month. So uh, any final thoughts on the Michigan game? And what are your thoughts on the state of the program at this point? Luke Fickle's just been announced as a Wisconsin head coach. Uh, crazy day in the Big Ten. Um, but what are your thoughts as of right now? Well, you know, I've got kind of mixed emotions about, you know, the the the, the outside possibilities that we could still qualify for the playoff. You know, you know, I, I, I just think that's uh, – that's a, kind of an interesting point for the program to be, but just the general state of the program is um, I, I think Ryan day and the powers that be at Ohio state need to do some soul searching because I do not, I, I thought I really truly believed that last year was an aberration. And I think there was a lot of reasons for it. I thought that was a, you know, a, a pretty good Michigan team with some really good players, especially on the defensive side. You talked about the weather, you talked about the flu, you talked about the home game. You talked about all those things. Man, there were no excuses yesterday, none whatsoever. And um, when when you come out and, and just completely dominate a team for a half and then are completely unprepared the second half, there's nobody to blame but the head coach. There's nobody, there's nobody left to blame. There's no Kerry Combs. There's no Greg Sadrar. There's nobody, there's nobody left to blame. It's the head coach. And so we have to face the reality that maybe our head coach is not up to the challenge of managing – a big time program like this and uh, being able to handle all the things. He was a you know, terrific position coach, but can he handle all the nuance and all the, the, you know, the, the rigor of a big game and the, the management of the, 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 the full bigger picture. And um, I don't think that's a reactionary opinion. I don't think that's like a, that I'm not angry. It's not an angry opinion. It's not something that, you know, I'm I'm not drunk saying that after the game. I just think it's a, you know, that when you have your, your, soul taken away from you the second year in a row by your rival in the big game and your quarterback's response is ah it doesn't matter that game doesn't define it like I, what in the world are you talking about like what in the world are you talking about i mean this is clearly you know one of the concerns about ryan was ryan had no connection to ohio state football was not raised in ohio um he basically he was in he was in obscurity urban meyer plucked him from obscurity when they made him the position, the offensive coordinator, and then ultimately the head coach, nobody had ever heard of Ryan Day before. Ryan Day was on the breadline; he was unemployed. Chip Kelly had fired him, I believe. So I mean, I don't think he was working. So it's like, I mean, you're really in a situation where, um, you know, I, I just, I, I think that we've got to really check ourselves in terms of, you know, what we're going to do to respond to this in terms of the rivalry. What does this game supposed to mean to the program? And um, like I said, I, 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 I've, I've never been as stunned. I've watched Ohio State football for a long time. I, I've seen good teams go up to Ann Arbor and get beat. But, you know, I think that, that stuff happens. Losing that way on a beautiful day with everything on the, on the table, when you're clearly better, when you're just clearly better and, and, you're, and you've, you've, you've dominated them for half and you can't do that, I think we've uh, – I, I think we've really got to take a look at the mirror and uh, make some decisions about what, what we're going to do going forward. And um, I think that's going to make this offseason a very, maybe one of the most intriguing ones of, uh, of my lifetime, because I think uh, there will be changes. And, but I mean, am I calling for the head coach to be removed? No, but I think some, uh, 
play calling responsibilities probably need to be reallocated. And I think that's probably going to happen. Yeah. He and ship all over him. Caleb Downs came in this week. There was some big time recruiting stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just an interesting, uh, we're at an interesting point with the, with the Buckeyes. All the latest will be on Buckeyescoop.com. I promise you there are a lot of people chirping right now after that game yesterday. Uh, a lot of people are talking. So uh, we'll have all that for you on Buckeyescoop.com. So I hope you guys tune in there. If you enjoyed this video, leave us a like. And in the comments, write what needs to change. Appreciate you guys as always. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. Thank you, Scoop family. Uh, go Bucks. Beat Michigan next year. Um, appreciate you guys. See ya.